We present The Antiquary by Walter Scott, adapted for radio by Robin Brooks. On a fine summer's day, near the end of the 18th century, a young man is waiting to take a public carriage from Edinburgh to Queensferry, where there is a passage boat for the crossing of the Firth of Forth. The hour has struck. Our young man amuses himself by speculating upon the character of his only fellow traveller, a man at the age of 60, with a large folio under his arm. You were a reading man, sir. Oh, my folio, you mean. A, a recent purchase. And what's the object of your studies? Uh, this is Sandy Gordon's Itinerarium Septentrionale, a book illustrative of Roman remains in Scotland. Are there many such? I know only what I read in Tacitus. Aha! Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Well, then you must know that there are other authorities for the doings of the ancients, such as urns, vases, votive altars, and above all, the marks of castrum. When the coach arrives at the ferry, it is clear from the extent of wet sand that the hour of tide is past. But the older man is now enjoying his conversation so much that he seems quite resigned to the delay. We'll have a snack here at the Hawes, and I'll be very happy to finish the account I was giving you of the difference between castra stativa and castra estiva. Do you mind me asking where you are bound, Mr Lovell? I'm bound for Fairport. Oh, as am I. It's my hometown. And for you, Mr Lovell, an excursion for pleasure? Uh, not entirely. Oh, perhaps they're on business with some of the commercial people there. I have no recourse to commerce there. So the two gentlemen, Mr Oldbuck and young Mr Lovell, travel together to Fairport. He invites his young acquaintance to dinner as soon as is convenient. Thus it is that, a few days later, Mr Lovell calls upon Mr Oldbuck at his venerable and solitary grange near to the town of Fairport and is conducted to his cabinet of curiosities. My sanctum sanctorum, as I call it. A sad jumble it may appear. Oh, no. But this profusion of trinkets and gewgaws... By no means. Oh, Mr. Lovell, please do not sit on that. That is an ancient coltrop or crotes lately dug up from a bog near Bannockburn, by which were lacerated the feet of the English chargers. I would not have it lacerate you, dear sir. I beg your pardon, sir. Here are treasures. So many books. So many parchments. But, sir, I have something in my grounds beyond my orchard which will astonish you the more. It commands a fine view. Do you not see anything else remarkable? Nothing upon the surface of the ground? Uh, I, I do see something like a ditch, indistinctly. Indistinctly? Pardon me, sir. Nothing can be more plainly traced. It is the Roman vallum with its ditch or fosse. Here stood a Roman fort. Fools have ploughed up three sides of it. But the fourth remains. I believe it marks the spot of the final confrontation between Agricola and the Caledonian tribes. As described in Tacitus. I have begun to dig, and I have found a stone on which appears the letters A-D-L-L. To stand for... Agricola, Decorwit, Libens, Lubens. Dedicated willingly and... Heartily. By Agricola. You must peruse my essay on the campaign. Over there was the left-hand gate, over there the right hand, and here the praetorium, where Julius Agricola himself perchance beheld the chariots of the savage Caledonians advancing. A praetorium here, praetorium there. A tall, grizzled beggar in a long blue mendicant's gown with a bag and a staff has stolen upon them. This is our beadsman, Mr. Lovell, Eddie Ochiltree. What's that you say, Eddie? About this bit of earth, Your Honour. I mind the building of it. The devil you do. Why, uh, you uh, old fool. It was here before you were born, and it will be here after you're hanged. What do you know about oh, it? Oh, I can this. For about twenty years, sign, I and the mason lads set to work and built this thing for Aiken Drum's bridle. A blithe day we had. And if you hook up the turf, you'll maybe find a stain that Ain of the Masons cut four letters on. A-D-L-L. -L, for Aiken Drum's Lang Ladle. There's some mistake about this. Oh, I never deal with mistakes. They bring mischances. Eddie, go down to the house and they'll give you your dinner. Only say nothing of that foolish story of yours. Oh, nobody shall get a word about it from me. Heaven reward, Your Honour. 
The rascal knows more old ballads and traditions than any other man in the parish, but I must look to it or he will spread his damned nonsensical story over half the county. Mr Oldbuck determines to invite him to dinner to meet his neighbour. Uh, this is my old friend, Sir Arthur Wardler. Sir? And this is my fair enemy, his daughter, Miss Isabel. Sir, and no man's enemy, although I know you only jest, Mr Oldbuck. <laughs> and this is my chicken pie, made after a recipe bequeathed me by my departed grandmother of happy memory. <laughs> when the port is on the table and Miss Isabel, who has been strangely silent, has as soon as possible retired, Old Buck and Sir Arthur enter into several exquisite discussions in which the younger guest takes but a slender share until he is started out of a profound reverie. How say you, Mr Lovell? Speak up, man. Uh, forgive me. About what? Oh, Lord. He has been wool-gathering all this time, no getting sense out of a young man once the women folk are invited. I beg your pardon, sir, sir. Why, man, as I was saying, there was once a people called the Picts. Or Pict. Properly, Picts. They spoke a Gothic dialect. Celtic. Picts. The learned Ritson is of my opinion. Ah, the erudite charmers of mine. <laughs> there is a list of Pictish kings. Half of them have the Celtic patronymic Mac, Macfedrus, Macfungus. Ah, mushroom monarchs, every one of them. Uh, the list was copied by Henry Maul. I laugh at Henry Maul and his history. Do not laugh at a better man than yourself. Maul was of high family. And a mere person such as myself should speak of him with deference. Oh, gentlemen. Because I am the son of a printer and do not number in my genealogy all the brawling, bullet-headed, iron-fisted old Gothic barons, none of whom could write their own name. If you sneer at my ancestry... Gentlemen, please. I shall take care how I honour with my company, one who shows himself so ungrateful to my condescension. Oh, Sir Arthur. Uh, stay a minute, Sir Arthur. Oh, Lord. I'll go after him, sir. <sighs> Isabel, I'm sorry to take you away. I am not sorry to depart, dear father. Oh. What's the matter? There's that Mr. Lovell. Oh, he seems to desire an opportunity to join us. Let us leave the lane and walk home by the sands. Ah, you don't want to meet the young fellow again, eh? Uh, very well, very well. I'll send this boy to meet the carriage. Hey, you! Me, sir. Boy! Yes, sir. Meanwhile, Mr. Oldbuck takes up a cup of tea and a volume of the Rambler. This is all one gets, putting oneself out of one's way to give dinners. The devil's in them. He proceeds in his studies for some time, until his manservant taps upon the door. Sir, I'm no easy in my mind. What is it? Sir Arthur and Miss Isabel. Well, they must be home long ago. No, sir. They did not go by the turnpike. They went by the sands. Along the sands? But, but the tide? Surely not. I saw them turn down by the Muscle Creek. Creek? God. An almanac. Bring me an almanac. What? Huh? Oh, never mind. Here it is. Oh, as I feared. Ropes! Fit some ropes! We must get out along the cliff! Bring some rope! Sir Arthur and his daughter pace along the sands, passing one projecting headland after another. On one side are iron-bound cliffs, and on the other a tide rising rapidly, lit by the rays of the declining sun and whipped up by a storm wind. I wish we had kept to the road. I do not fear. We shall get round. Uh, look, there is someone coming to meet us. He must have passed the headland. Turn back! Turn back! It's Eddie Ockletree. Why do you not turn back? We will get round the head. The tide will be running there by now. That's all I can do to get round. Well, we'll maybe get back and it's our only hope. God, my child. Dear father. I heard you were here from the lad he sent to meet your carriage. I couldn't have to think of the dainty young lady's peril. Oh, make haste, my bonny lady. We will make Nest Point. Whoever saw a race as the tide is running now. They struggle forward through the rising storm and gathering dark in the double agony of terror and suspense. You see, you see yon wee black speck among the waves yonder? Yes. Well, well we see yonder rock. We'll get round the Ness. But as they come to a turn in the path around the cliff bottom, for a moment the rock is hidden from sight 
and when they emerge, the signal of safety is lost in a mass of breakers which rise in prodigious sheets of snowy foam against the dark brow of the precipice. God have mercy on us. Oh, my child, my poor child. Good man, can you think of nothing? I'll make you rich. I'll give you a farm. Oh, riches will soon be equal. I hae near land, and you would give your fair bones and barony for a dry square of rock. Oh. They clamber up onto the highest ledge of the cliff that they can reach to await the sure progress of the raging element. Is there no way to climb up? Oh, not without a rope. With a rope. This is the only... What but oh, his name be praised. I've seen coming down the crag now. Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. That way, that, that there is a root of tree to fasten on there. Not an attack your time, carry lad. I'll win it, you, and then we'll get the young lady up, and then Sir Arthur. Hey! I fasten the rope. I can climb it again and fetch assistance. Do so, Mr. Lovell, for heaven's sake. It is too dark. No, have no fear. I've marked all the places as I came down. There's still light enough, but not much time. If, if I are going up with you, we can haul them up. Leave me. Let death spare the green corn and take the ripe. Oh, no, Father. I see them. I see them down on that flat stone. Hello! Here's a rope, Mr. Roebuck. Someone's gone down. It's Lovell. Uh, there he is, tying the young lady on. Forgive me this liberty. I understand. Is that secure? Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, it is. You need not apologise. Pull! Pull away! Oh, Mr. Oldbuck! Have a care! <gasps> Miss Water, I will convey you home. Not till I see my father safe. Bones away! Look to Sir Arthur! The whole barony depends on three plies of hemp. All the way! One by one, the three men are plucked from the rising water. Lovell, the last to go up. Is Miss Warder safe? I have sent her home in the carriage straight away. I'm sure she would thank you. I must go home then. I'm wet to the skin. No, 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 sir. Not one bit. You will come home with me, get into a warm bed and have a change of dry clothes this instant. Come along now. In fact, Miss Warder had lingered until she was sure that Mr. Lovell was safe. But he remained unaware that she had expressed any interest in the fate of the young man who had assisted her in the hour of peril. Now, as he lies beneath warm sheets in Mr. Oldbuck's guest bed, his thoughts run on her. She was determined not to acknowledge me. She was keen to escape from my company, and that's what brought her into danger. She only desires to shut the door against hope, to extinguish a passion which she cannot return. It is not extinguished. But I will see her no more. Tomorrow, I will leave this place. You look pale, Mr. Lovell. Was the bed damp? Not at all, sir. The, the accommodation was excellent. Well, then you must stay another night. I'm greatly obliged, but... But me no buts. I have my heart set on it. I'm afraid I must soon think of leaving Fairport. <sighs> Alas. But at least today I aim to walk as far as Knockwinner Castle and inquire after the old knight and my fair foe, Miss Isabel, if you would accompany me. I'm a stranger to them. Do you think that Sir Arthur might in civility expect a call from me? Of course. Let us go, by all means. I shall show you the grave of John o' the Gunnel on the way. Here lieth John o' ye Gunnel, earth hath ye knit, and heaven ye kernel. At Knockwinnock Castle, the fair Miss Isabel leans out at the parlour window, musing upon her adventures of the night before. Why should it be my fate to receive such help from one whose passion I have laboured to discourage? Why should chance have given him this advantage over me? And as she muses, she sees the old beggar, Eddie Ochiltree, enter the castle courtyard. Eddie? Oh, my lady. Eddie sits down on an old stone bench beside the parlour window, and Miss Isabel leans out to talk with him. I don't know how to thank my preserver. Oh, it, it wasn't just me. But promise me, Eddie, if you ever wish to settle, 
when you turn old. <laughs> if you choose to reside here at the castle, there will always be a place for you by the fire. Uh, no, no, miss. What would all the country about do for one to Eddie that brings the news and country cracks from a farmstead into another? Trust, Lily, I, I can only do my vacation. Well, then, in the meantime, take this. Oh, no, 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 my lady. And then attack Muckle Silver at Ains. Uh, and they say Sir Arthur himself has run himself out with his hokings and minings for lead and copper. We have enough to pay our debts. Uh, and requiting you is one of the foremost. Is there nothing I can do for you? Uh, well, there's a thing, maybe. Uh, it shall be done, if it is in my power. Oh, it is, it is. <laughs> uh, you're a bonny young lady and a good one. Then you turn the the lad, Lovell, as you did the whale side on the walk beneath the briery bank. I have no recollection. Oh, I, I saw you beef. Heard you too. I'm sure I, I don't you know. Can't you with the lad, for he loves you well, and it's by him and not the only thing I could have done for you that you and Sir Arthur were saved just at eve. Huh? And good day to you, no, my young lady. Good day. Without waiting for an answer, he walks away towards the kitchens. Miss Isabel remains for a moment, leaning against the window ledge, until she suddenly observes Old Buck and young Lovell entering the courtyard. Maggie? Maggie? Miss? We have visitors. Show them to the drawing room. I will be with them in a little while. Oh, yes, miss. Mr Old Buck. Mr Lovell. You look well, my fair foe, as so though flying up cliffs has been your natural occupation. And how fair, Sir Arthur? Indifferently well, I'm afraid. Not able to receive your congratulations or thank Mr Lovell. I had no thought of intruding, as one who must be associated with painful reflections. Please do not think my father ungrateful. I am sure he would be happy to show his gratitude in any way Mr. Lovell could consider proper. And what sort of qualification is that? Let us have no more of that nonsense. We'll see him another day. Uh, what news from the mines? Anything good? I fear not. There lie some specimens lately sent. Ah, I'll examine them. I did not want... That is, um, Mr. Oldbook was very pressing... Mr. Lovell... I am sure you are incapable of abusing our gratitude. And if you could see me as a friend, as a sister... You may repel my sentiments, but I will not deny them. I am much embarrassed by your attentions. Very well. You are hurt. I am sorry. But can I do otherwise without my father's consent? He will never, as you must know. Please suppress this unfortunate attachment. Teach your mind to submit. My lady. Miss Isabel, what's become of Mr Lovell? Gone out for fresh air. Do you know each other? I met Mr Lovell when I resided this last spring with my aunt in Yorkshire. Oh, then why did you not recognise him when I introduced you? My father did not approve. Why ever not? My father believes there are prejudices concerning the purity of his birth. Oh, illegitimate, eh? I see. The bend sinister. Poor lad. The castle makes a fine prospect, does it not, Mr Lovell? Indeed. You would not guess that this ancient family is going fast into the ground. You surprise me. We must harden ourselves to the changes of this trumpery, whirly gig world. I would not be a stoic with a heart of stone. Wait till your bark has been battered by the storms of sixty years. You will learn to reef your sails. And not be concerned by the ruin of a family. But how are they come to such a pass? Sir Arthur's embarrassments have become very pressing. He thought to extricate himself by a scheme of mining for copper. I believe his agents are scoundrels. They have ruined him. My heart aches for him and for the poor young lady who must share his distress. 